This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Welcome to episode 112. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. We have another great episode for you today. Nicola Kornick returns to the show, and this time we focus our chat on the Lovells, Francis and Anne. And if you don't know who they are, I highly recommend you take a listen today. And then on Ask the Expert, Steph invited Dr. Lauren Mackay to answer your questions on the Boleyn men. And lastly, on A Brief History, I tell you all about the daughter of Margaret Tudor, Henry VIII's elder sister. Her name, Lady Margaret Douglas. A special shout out to my newest patrons, Melissa M., William L., Lacey B., Jamie O., Chelsea, Logan B., Tammy M., and Jennifer A., Thank you so much for your support, and thank you for the ongoing support of my existing patrons as well. Now, if you'd like to become a patron, you can do so on either Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, or Podbean. Patrons receive all kinds of great freebies like access to my tutor course and books. So if you would feel so inclined to reward me with your pledge, I would be ever so grateful to you. Now, I'll include a link in the show notes for all of that. All right, without further ado, Nicola Kornick. Nicola, welcome back. Thank you so much for inviting me back. It's such a pleasure to chat to you again. You know, you are such a popular commodity around here because on the next episode, you're actually going to be on Ask the Expert with Steph. Yes, I, I'm really looking forward to that as well. Um, I'll be. Uh, that that's uh, that's about um, Amy Robsart, isn't it? So uh, yeah, I can't wait to see what uh, what questions people have got. <laughs> you just never know sometimes what's going to come out of the listener um, question. Oh, so I'm looking forward to. Sounds it. exciting. <laughs> <laughs> now the last time you were on, we chatted about Amy Robsart and we chatted oh. about Mary Seymour, of course, among other things. Uh, but this yeah. time we are stepping back a little further in time with you. We're going to talk about your next book which is out a little later this year. I think I said it's out in the UK in July. Yes, that's right. Okay, it's another dual-time novel, novel that covers a, a subject of interest, I think, for many of us English history lovers, or maybe I should say mystery lovers. <laughs> it covers yes. one of the princes in the tower. So before we continue and talk more about that, um, I notice that maybe there's two different titles for this book as well. Can you go into that? Yes. Um, the book's called, in the UK, the book's called The Last Daughter. Um, and there was a lot of discussion because in North America, where it's coming out in the autumn, um, they wanted to present it more, more of the historical side of it. Um, and so they have chosen to call the book The Last Daughter of York. Um, so uh, so that's quite a, quite an intriguing title. I really actually really like that. Um, so, yes, it's got a slightly different titles in the, in the two different markets, but it's uh, it's the same book. So in this novel, you introduce your readers to two people that we don't often hear about, and that's Francis Lovell and his wife, Anne. Can you give us an idea? Because these are two people we don't often hear about. Who were Francis and Anne separately? Okay. It's interesting, isn't it, that we don't hear um, much about these two, because, of course, Francis Lovell was a very prominent friend of uh, King Richard III, um, his, his chamberlain, a, a really um, powerful and influential member of his court, as well as a, an almost lifelong friend of his. So uh, he's, he's somebody who's been a kind of a walk-on, had a walk-on part in a lot of fiction, I think. Um, and, of course, in um, actual historical research as well, um, apart from Michel Schindler's book, about uh, about Francis Lovell. I'm not aware of um, uh, books that specifically uh, look at research Francis's background and story. So it's surprising in a way that such a prominent character hasn't had more written about him, I think. Um, Anne, even more so, Anne, uh, Anne Lovell, Anne Fitzhugh, as she was um, his wife, um, I think, uh, as you know, Rebecca, I love writing about women uh, from the footnotes of history, whether it's uh, Mary Seymour or Amy Robsart. And Anne Lovell is another one who fits 
beautifully into that category. She's somebody who you barely ever hear of. And then if you do, it's usually in relation to Francis or to um, to Richard III's court or whatever. So I really wanted to, to explore Anne's story and my interest in her was sort of whetted. So that's why I chose her to be the heroine of the historical thread of this particular book. What inspired you for the concept um, of this book? Um, I think it's all about people who disappear. Um, sometimes I just start writing and I don't really pin down before I start exactly what uh, what what it's about. And it comes to me later, oh, you know, it's what I'm exploring here, really. So in the modern day thread, of, as it's a dual time book, that's also about a missing persons case. Um, and in the historical thread, of course, both Richard um, of Shrewsbury, the second son of, of Edward um, the fourth, and Francis Lovell in different ways, both disappeared. Nobody's absolutely certain what happened to either of them. So this whole idea is, is held together by the, the, the concept of um, what happens when someone disappears. And of course, the other thing is um, it, a mystery like that is just obviously a, a gift to a, uh, to a historical fiction writer because you've got that, that sort of space to fill with your imagination. I'm so intrigued by this book because I think I read in a description something along the lines where Francis and Anne are responsible for Prince Richard. Can you go into that a little bit without giving up the whole book? <laughs> that might be spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, th there's no reason. I mean, I I'm sure I'm, I'm sure that um, during the course of all of their separate lives, they did come across each other. Um, but uh, in, in, the, in the story, I create a much closer relationship between Francis Anne um, and Richard than in um, in real life. It's difficult. There's a lot of Richards in this story, um, and it's kind of confusing. So, uh, so certainly we know uh, as historical fact that there was a very close relationship between Richard III and Francis. We don't know for sure how much involvement Francis had in the other things that were going on around the, you know the period from when Richard became uh, king in, in 1483. We can only look at the uh, look at the evidence and. and try and infer what, what happened there. So, but I have taken that as the focus of, of, of my, uh, of, of that part of the story, really, the, the relationship that Francis and Anne might have had uh, with the younger of the two princes. When we talk about the princes in the tower, we generally immediately go to the pretenders, right? Yeah, so that's, that is interesting. And it's such a complicated period of history as well, I think, and actually slightly digressing. But one of the problems that I did have writing um, a book like this, which, of course, because it's a contemporary and a historical thread, you've got a limited number of um, number of words that you can spend on each each part. And I realised as soon as I kind of got into all of this history and, you know, um, uh, the, the different pretenders popping up and how much how much of this am I going to put in this story and you know which of them are going to come in when I actually started I had Henry the seventh I had quite he featured quite heavily in the story and Lambert Simnel popped up and all kinds of stuff went on and I soon realized that it's such a complex period that you have to really distill it down if you're going to write a fairly tightly written novel around it so that was actually a huge problem for me so um, I, I had to really really focus in and um and, and i and and it was very difficult actually deciding what to put in and what to leave out and so i didn't actually focus too much on on that side of things i kept the story very closely tied to francis and to his um well his career politically with richard the third but then also what happened to him after the battle of bosworth um and after the battle of stoke so that was my that was my focus but uh, yeah it's oh, uh, there were times when i just thought i wish i'd never started this because there's so much here you know what how do how do you do this how do you write a, a fictional uh, representation of this unless it's 700 pages long I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. In your mm -hmm. in your research on this, did you find any evidence that would lead you to believe that something like this was possible, that Prince Richard could have survived? That's really interesting, isn't there? Because there is a very strong, well, there, there's always been very strong rumours, and there's a, a strong school of thought that says, yes, this, this is possible. Um, and I think... 
because for my story, I had a particular solution to <laughs> to what happened. I'm really having to be really careful here because I can feel myself almost giving all kinds <laughs> of things away. Um, uh, so I was very focused on that. I mean, uh, interestingly, I studied um, the, his the history of, uh, of, of this particular period, both for my undergraduate degree and when I I wrote about Richard III for my master's thesis. So I had done a lot of a lot of background research. I had got a lot of grounding in it, but I'm also very aware I've got a lot of an emotional connection to it, which I think a lot of people have to this particular bit of history, which is really interesting. So I was already conflicted <laughs> about it all. And of course, you know, I really wanted, I wanted both of the princes to, uh, to survive. I just had an, a, a, a kind of, that was my natural inclination. So I was kind of fighting this sort of, historians attempt at objectivity was fighting against my novelists um, my, my, my writing as a novelist all the way through this book so I would probably come across some evidence to suggest something happened to think well yeah uh, I hope I hope that's right but I'm sticking to my story here <laughs> so um, so I think one of the caveats I put on this book is whatever happens in this story is very unlikely to be the solution <laughs> to what happened to the princes in the tower <laughs> It's got to be so it's a good hard. Story anyway. <laughs> oh, I look forward to reading it when it comes out because you always do such a great job intertwining these two stories, the two timelines. Can you go into any detail at all on your dual time in this book? Uh, yes, there is a very there, there's a very close connection um, between the two stories in this book because it's set at Minster Lovell, which um, was one of um, Francis Lovell's main houses, and so there's a kind of link in the in the actual setting, the, the ruins of the old manor house, um, and, and the and the contemporary story is is set in exactly the same place. So you do see quite a lot of mirroring of what happened in the historical story uh, in the contemporary one. Uh, and I did I absolutely loved writing that. I, I'm, Mr. Lovell is an incredible sort of atmospheric place. I think it's you know it's going to inspire anybody really. Um, and and so it was it was felt right to draw those those two ideas together and of course as i say it's all about people disappearing so you know richard disappeared francis disappeared there's a character in the story that disappeared and also at minster lovell there's and there's the story of the mistletoe bride who also disappears the story of this 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 strange sort of legend of of the woman who rather rather horrific really who gets trapped in the um in a trunk on her, her wedding day and nobody finds her and, uh, and and they only discover her years later so there's all these really interesting threads in folklore and history uh, sort of swirling around Minster Lovell. And, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the modern day, the historical came together really all around that idea of how could this happen? What, where could, what could have happened to all these people? Did you say she got stuck in a trunk on her wedding day? <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's a really, it's, it's a... A uh, very interesting, well-known piece of local folklore, both in this area where where I live and 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 because I'm near Minster Lovell, but also it's a story that's quite prevalent in other places in British history. Uh, the idea the, it's called the Mistletoe Bride because the idea is that there's a bride who uh, it's Christmas when they have the wedding, they play hide and seek. She goes off and, and hides in a in, in in a trunk, and nobody's bright enough to work out where she is, and she's of course locked herself in, and nobody ever finds. So it's actually quite a gruesome sort of legend, really. Um, but it's, it's as I say, there's various places in the country where it, cla it, it was claimed that this actually happened. Uh, and one of those is Minster Lovell. She was said to have been the bride of one of the earlier Lovells. Um, and so I just thought that was a, another great sort of example of how this these stories of disappearances were sort of generated around this particular place uh, and then of course the story that after the battle of uh, stoke francis himself went back to minster level and again hid there uh, and then disappeared and again a really gruesome piece of folklore that uh, he was being fed by a, an aged and a lo loyal retainer who unfortunately one day dropped down dead so nobody knew where francis was and so he starved to death so it, it's kind of there's a lot of really interesting um, legends and again as you know I'm kind of drawn to those sort of folklore stories because sometimes there's quite a uh, at least a germ of real history in them somewhere and I like sort of 
trying to work out where they've come from. And of course, uh, again, they're amazing stories. They're kind of inspiring for a for a novelist. So I took all of these things. <laughs> I'm making it sound incredibly complicated. Hopefully in the story, it, it's kind of fairly clear. It's following this, as I say, this theme of, of disappearance and, um, and, and the stories that grow up around that, which, which I just find fascinating. Sounds so interesting. I can't, I'm so excited to read this one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I want to go back to Anne again, um, mm-hmm. because the title of your book is throwing me a little bit. And I want to understand, is the last daughter of York pertaining to her or where does where does that go? I don't know anything about Anne Lovell. OK, so the last daughter uh stroke last daughter of York actually pertains to the modern thread of the story. So it's quite a big clue um, as to what happens in the contemporary thread of the story. So um, that um, that that actually uh, relates to, um, to to the heroine of the contemporary thread, who's called Serena. Um, so Anne Lovell is entirely separate to that. So uh, so yes, titles, particularly for this book, uh, proved to be a, a terrible problem. We went backwards and forwards so many times over the title and what we should call it. And of course, my uh, American editor also had a had. had thoughts about that as well. So The Last Daughter of York, I actually think, is a very relevant title to the story. And I hope when you read it, you'll feel that it is appropriate. Um, But I can't really say any more about that without giving even more away. But Anne is separate to that completely. So, I mean, if if you'd like me just to say a bit about who Anne was, again, separately from, from being Lady Lovell, because, of course, she was a person in her own right. Um, Anne was a Neville, so she was a daughter of the Neville clan. She was a niece of the Earl of Warwick, the kingmaker. Um, and so that immediately kind of places her in a, in a powerful family um, in the north. She grew up in Yorkshire, um, which I think was another a, a sort of another draw for me because um, I, I'm a Yorkshire girl. And, um, and Anne um, grew up on, 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 the, on the moors of, of North Yorkshire um, at a castle called Ravensworth. Uh, her father was Lord Fitz. Hugh, but her mother was Anne was was Alice Neville, the sister of of the Kingmaker. So she was born into this incredibly powerful family, um, and as you know, as was often the way, um, she was she and the, the marriage with Francis was put together as a, as an alliance because they were both very young, um, in order to gain more supporters on uh, for for, for, for um, Richard Neville, um, and so um, that's how she sort of comes into this bigger picture. As as as, as a, a, a member of the Neville clan, and and that's a theme in the story as well. Because I think from my research and my reading, that's that's always kind of felt really important. You know, to be a Neville was to be important, and it also meant that you had a political destiny as well. Um, and so uh, so that is a, a, a little bit of what I explore in the book as well. Do we know how the marriage came about between her and Francis? Was there a family connection or how were they connected? Well, Francis was a, um, his wardship came up very, when he was very young. He was, I think he was eight and Anne was five when they, when they were married. Um, and of course, as a, as a, a potentially a rich Lord, his wardship was very valuable. So it had been passed around to various people and it was given, um, to the Earl of, of, of Warwick as these things were, as, as, uh, um, as a kind of reward, and Warwick was looking uh, amongst his own relatives to to, to make the, to make an alliance to keep Francis on side, basically, uh, as he grew up. So Anne was chosen, interestingly, as a younger a younger daughter, maybe probably because she was closer in age to Francis, both of them being children at the time. Um, so that was how it how it came about. And of course, as all the political loyalties shifted and during the, the, the course of the Wars of the Roses, um, when um, Richard uh, Neville, when the Kingmaker fell, uh, fell from power and um, Francis's wardship was then taken away and given to somebody else. So there was a lot of, of, of just moving these people around, these children around like little chess pieces. Um, uh, and and 
you know, sort of, it's extraordinary to think that they grew up from that young age, married to each other, um, and with all of this sort of swirling around them, right from the very start, you know, their entire lives were dominated by all of the, the everything that happened during the, the events of the Wars of the Roses, right from the earliest age. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really fascinating story for the two of them, I think. And, I liked the idea that they grew up together and that they kind of formed a friendship and a bond first as as, as children, really, and then their relationship developed from there. But again, I'm, I won't say any more about that because, again, that is part of that's part of the story. Um, but uh, yeah, they're a very attractive couple to write about, I think, because they're very interesting. So it sounds like they had a happy marriage. Well, I think um, I felt from reading the evidence um, that that they had. Um, I mean. It, Francis and, and Anne, I don't know if, um, I, d- I don't know how widely this is known, but a lot of people who've read The Sun in Splendour, for example, will know that um, Anne Lovell quite often appears as a not a, not a particularly attractive or likeable character in fiction, and I'm not sure why that should be. Uh, but certainly I remember very clearly from when I read The Sun in Splendour that she was a sort of cold, haughty creature and not very likeable. Um, and And I don't really know why you would choose to portray the marriage in that way, because I think a bit of research does suggest that, you know, they were close, whether it was the kind of relationship that had grown out of simply, you know, always being in each other's lives um, as they had from being children, whether something um, grew out of that or whether they were just sort of close because of because they supported each other they were very loyal to each other all the way through and that's a, a very attractive quality I think I think their relationship was a very interesting one I would say that they were were happy together yes definitely did they have any children no and that is again a really interesting element of their story I think particularly you know in the context of what it was like to 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 be a to be childless at that time the importance obviously attached to having an heir the importance for a wife of providing um, a family uh, and that is a very a, another again a very interesting aspect of their relationship sort of to explore why they might not have had children clearly Francis didn't um, didn't think that it was in any way Anne's fault because um, he specifically in his will um, left uh, estates and, and um, land to her um, that would go to any f- future child of hers from another marriage. So it wasn't, you know, it, it, that's quite an intriguing thing. You don't come across that very often. So there was obviously something there that that was that that, that uh, was interesting. And and yes, I mean, it, it, I, again, I think I'm quite drawn towards writing particularly heroines um, like Amy Robsart and and, um, and Anne Lovell, who don't have children in that kind of society and that sort of context, because the pressure to have produced an heir must have been enormous and the effect that that had on their lives. So that's, again, something else that really interests me um, about characters like that. We never have enough time to talk about everything I want to talk about. But before we get to the If I Made You Choose um, game, I want you to kind of leave our listeners um, with a little bit, uh, maybe a, a teaser or something that you'd like to leave them with so that they want to explore this story a little bit more. Ooh, gosh, that's... <laughs> yeah, you have put me on the spot there. Um, I think I hope that anybody who um, is, and I mean, I know there are a lot of us out there. Anybody who has ever been intrigued by the story of uh, Richard the Third and the princes in the Tower and the potential, um, uh, the potential solution to that. Anyone who's intrigued by that mystery, I hope that they would. Uh, find the way that I explore that in the book um, quite intriguing. And as I say, when you come to the end, you probably will think, well, obviously that can't possibly have happened, but hey, it was a good story on the way. So that that's that that's what I'd like people to take away from this. If you like the, if you like uh, Richard the Third and the story of the princes in the tower, I hope you'll be intrigued by this book. And I can almost guarantee you will, because Nicola, you always do such a great job of pulling history into a a story and making it more interesting and accessible to people. 
Oh, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Well, now we come to if I made you choose. And so oh. <laughs> the way this game works is I give you two characters from history and I make you choose between them and I try not to make it easy on you. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, so the first one is Edward the Fourth or Richard the Third. Oh, yeah, that is that isn't. That's not easy, but instinctively, I have to choose Richard III. I've been a Ricardian since I was 11 years old. So, you know, what can I do? (laughs) Well, if that's the only reason why, then I can take it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I am completely going on um, instinct and and kind of, oh, you know what it's like when you've been attached to a particular historical course for so long. You do know what that's like, Rebecca. Uh, (laughs) You can't, you just, you just can't help it, can you? That, that is just me going with, with my, my fundamental loyalty to Richard there. (laughs) Wonderful. Oh, the next one, it pertains to this book. So I want you to choose between Francis Lovell or his wife, Anne. Uh, oh, I have to choose Anne. I mean, I I love Francis. He's 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 a great character. I don't mean necessarily in my book, but as a as a historical character, he's a really interesting man. But I again, I'm always uh, on the side of the the women from the foot, footnotes. They're they're the ones whose stories I want to sort of uh, to explore and bring out because you hear so little about them and they're so fascinating. Okay, I'm interested in the next one. I'm pairing up a couple more of your book subjects again. No. <laughs> <laughs> this time, I want to know if I made you choose between Mary Seymour or Amy Robsart. <sighs> okay, um, that is really tough, but I'm going to go with Mary Seymour. Um, again, and I think some somebody who's who's read the the proof copy of the book um, said that there's a, there are strong similarities between this book and the Phantom Tree, and that both the character of Anne and the character of Mary Seymour you get to know them in the book from when they were children, really young. So you see them grow and and develop, um, and and I and I and I really like that as as well. You know, I I think when I studied Mary, I kind of. I wanted to know all about, you know, how she might have grown from being that, that from the, you know, tiny child. And it's the same with Anne. Um, so, yeah, again, um, I, I have to, oh, it's so hard, though. The questions are so hard. You see, I could feel myself thinking, is that right, though? Amy Robsot's so interesting. Oh, well, yes, there's no I'm, r- sticking, I'm sticking with Mary. I'm sticking with Mary Seymour. I was like, there's no wrong answer. It's your choice. <laughs> That's lucky. <laughs> Now, the last one is my favorite one, and everybody gets this one. I I change up the other four, but the last one is always the same, and I'm sure you've heard it before, either Thomas Seymour or Edward Seymour. Always Thomas Seymour. (laughs) Always. (laughs) It's funny, I was talking about this. I I did a talk this last week, uh, and I was talking about the brothers Seymour, uh, and, um, you know, I don't know. um, Thomas is just... (sighs) Well, honestly, we could talk about Thomas for ages, couldn't we? But he's just he's just more charismatic, isn't he? Let's be honest. Um, there's there's more to explore there, more that's interesting, I think. it's. Uh, but that's just me. I mean, you know, I'm sure Edward had a great many good qualities, but somehow they don't seem as attractive. Thomas was just complicated. I think I think mm. that's what draws yes. me to him. He was a complicated character. Absolutely. And I think that, and, and that is that kind of, that really pins down what's so interesting about a lot of these historical characters that you can explore through, through fiction, as well as through reading history. You know, it's, it is those layers of person, personality, the things that you recognize in them that are, are qualities that you see in people now, or the things you think, oh, I really wonder why he behaved like that or whatever. That is what really fascinates me about all of writing about all of these, these people, because they are so layered. And yes, absolutely. Thomas was very, very complicated, really interesting. Wouldn't it be interesting to have even just half an hour to have a chat to see if you could get a handle on what he was really like? Oh my gosh, indeed. <laughs> you know, you, you, uh, you said something that really struck home with me because I've always said there was something about Thomas Seymour that resonates with me. I see something similar between the two of us that I can mm. relate to his story. So is there any one of your characters that you felt like you could relate to the most? Ah, oh, that is very interesting. Um, yes, I think, well, I think 
I immediately thought of Anne Lovell when you said that, because, um, yeah, as, as we were saying, um, a kind of a, a, a girl, I mean, we, there aren't that many fundamental obvious similarities between the two of us, other than they were both come from the north of England, which is incredibly important if you come from the north of England. It's kind of quite a, a tribal thing. Um, but I, I, I don't know. Somebody who read the book said, oh, there's a lot of you in this character. Uh, so, yes, I think I do identify with some of her struggles and some of her beliefs. So, yes, I, I, um, yeah, I feel quite a strong identity, identification with her. That's so interesting, Rebecca. I, 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 I'm going to think a lot about the different characters now and, and sort of what it is that draws you to them. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting, isn't it? Well, we write what we know, right? Yes, we do. But I think we also, sometimes you don't really know what you know, if, if that makes sense. You know, you're exploring something which maybe you know instinctively, but you're not conscious of. So, um, so that, that's, a very, that's a really interesting um, observation. Well, Nicola, thank you so much for coming back on the show again. Can you let everybody know where they can find you and where they can buy your books? Yes. Uh, well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me back again. Um, if anybody would like to find me, um, my website is uh, nicolacornick.co.uk. I'm on Facebook and Twitter where I absolutely adore chatting with people about history and writing and just about anything else. Um, and my books are all available on Amazon, Co and Com and um, in the bookstores as well. So this new book will be uh, the, the Last Daughter is coming out, The Last Daughter of York and The Last Daughter, um, July the 8th in the UK. And I think it's probably going to be November in North America, but um, I will confirm that when they've confirmed it to me. Uh, and I really hope that um, that everybody will enjoy this particular take on the story of the princes in the tower. And if you are new to Nicola's books, I highly recommend that you check them out, especially if you were listening today and you thought, wow, this sounds like an interesting concept or I want to learn more about these characters in history. This is a wonderful place to get started. So go pre-order her book now. And now, Ask the Expert. I'm Steph and I'm here with Dr. Lauren Mackay, author and historian. She's the author of Inside the Tudor Court, which is the first biography of Eustace Chapuis, and Among the Wolves of Court, which is the untold story of Thomas and George Boleyn, which inspired our talk today. She's here with us to answer your questions about some of the Boleyn men. So thank you. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you for having me. We're going to kick things off with our friends at the Renaissance Chronicles. Uh, we're going to start off with Thomas Boleyn first. They were wondering if you could give us a little insight into what he was like prior to his daughters catching the eye of King Henry VIII. Where did he come from? How did he build his career? Just give us a little sense of who he was. So Thomas Boleyn came from uh, quite a good background. His grandfather was Thomas Butler, of course, the very powerful Earl. So he had a great pedigree and his father-in-law, of course, would be one of uh, Thomas Howard, the second Duke of Norfolk. So he already had good pedigree when he gets to court. But he has actually built on uh, generations of Berlins who have come before him, who have really uh, sort of elevated themselves from simple, uh, simply a family that lived on the land to a family that actually owned many properties and were an integral part of especially the counties of Norfolk and of Kent. So Thomas Boleyn's career begins when he's about 20 years old, 1497 or thereabouts, and he really begins his career in King Henry VII's army alongside his father. So he's part of the Kentish contingency putting down a rebellion uh, down near Cornwall. So it's, an, it's a very respectable entry into court for a young man. And really from those first years under Henry VII's reign, we see Thomas Boleyn already emerging as an individual who is reliable, who is popular, who is well-liked. He's actually made one of the esquires of the body, serving Henry VII. So he's building his rise even as a young man at court. And he's there, as I said, alongside his father and his grandfather and his father-in-law. 
So it's a very impressive uh, few years, even before Henry VIII ascends to the throne. He then becomes engaged in diplomacy, and it's not exactly clear how he makes that leap because he doesn't really have any uh, diplomatic experience, but he is put into uh, a new diplomatic mission, and he stands out really as a new face in the, in the diplomatic protocol and, and lineup. So he's clearly a young man who has connections at court, but he's definitely uh, someone who's intelligent enough and and skilled enough and educated enough to really build upon those foundations. So by the time Henry VIII ascends the throne in 1509, Thomas Boleyn is already immersed in court politics and he already has this fantastic reputation. So this is decades before Anne Boleyn is even a thought or even a glimmer in his eyes, I should say. Okay, well, let's take a leap forward then to when she might be a glimmer in his eye. (laughs) So let's fast forward a little bit to him now having adult children, two of whom we all know had a relationship with Henry VIII. Trina Warwick asks, what are your thoughts on the greed of Thomas Boleyn? Do you think that he willfully pushed his girls towards the king? Or did he just kind of figure out the best way to make the best of that situation that seemed to already be unfolding before him. We have to remember that the Tudor court at the very center is the king, and he is the font from which all patronage, opportunity, and power emerges. So to say that Thomas Boleyn is greedy, it's it's the wrong word. The Boleyns are ambitious. Every family at court is ambitious. That's the only way you're going to get ahead. That's that's why you're at court. You are circling that font of power, the King of England. His greed, uh, that is, as I said, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't make sense to say that he's greedy. He is ambitious for his children. He is ambitious for his family. He has already built, as I said, upon generation of generation of Boleyns working their way up. He has educated Anne Boleyn to be a formidable woman in her own right. So he's not pushing his daughters forward towards the king. He is ensuring that they are elevated uh, to a status that he thinks they are worthy of to be powerful women in their own right. Thomas Boleyn wants his daughter Mary to marry William Carey, who comes from a very good family with royal connections, and he cultivates a relationship with his son-in-law. Uh, it's very unfortunate, of course, that William Carey dies. And in fact, the fact that Thomas Boleyn has a rather acrimonious relationship at times with his daughter Mary, I believe, is because she came, she became mistress to the King of England. That was not the trajectory he had in mind for her. He didn't want his daughters to become mistresses to the King of England. That is such a finite uh, period of power. He wanted them to go on to make great marriages and to do well for themselves and to elevate the family and keep that status going, you know, with their generation and the generations that were to come. I don't I think once of course Anne Boleyn did attract the king's attention, Thomas Boleyn reluctantly fell in line because he could see I guess that his daughter this was what this was what was going to happen. However, it took him a very long time to get on board. I think for him he's a very cautious man Thomas Boleyn and this was a quite an unprecedented situation. There was no guarantee that the king of England was actually going to divorce his wife. Uh, Queen Catherine of Aragon. So it wasn't really, it took a very long time for Thomas Boleyn to uh, become a a supporter of, of his daughter's venture to become Queen of England. But certainly, I think we have to remember the times. This is not him pimping out his daughters, pushing his daughters towards anything. Uh, the King of England is the most powerful man in your realm. And if he's, if he's pursuing your daughter, there's not much you can really do to shield her. So it, it was an impossible situation for him. But certainly this idea that he's greedy, we have to stop shaming the Boleyns for the same sort of ambition that every family at the Tudor court had. Right. Thank you. Well, jumping ahead a little further then, um, spoiler alert, Thomas's daughter Anne does ultimately get beheaded <laughs> uh, as, as his son George. So Hannah Larson wonders if there's any evidence to show that Thomas and his wife were back at court shortly after their children's demise. Were they able to get right back in? <laughs> 
It's interesting because historians, I mean, the, the Boleyns can't really win one way or another. There are two sort of narratives that either Thomas Boleyn spent the rest of his days a rejected man in exile down at Hever, or in the words of one historian, he completely was undeterred by the deaths of his children and worked about worming his way up the greasy pole once more. What we have to remember is that Thomas Boleyn is a peer of the realm. He is obliged to be at court for various occasions and functions. He can't get out of them. That, it, that, that is literally his duty as a peer of the realm. And the first real public uh, emergence of Thomas Boleyn after the deaths of his children is quite heartbreaking because it's at the christening of Prince Edward, so the, the son and heir Henry VIII had longed for for so long, and, of course, the son of Jane Seymour. And Thomas Boleyn has been so judged for being, not only being at this christening, but having to actually play a role in the christening. And we tend to not not really think about the fact that this is not him uh, volunteering for the job. This is Henry VIII making his former father-in-law trail behind the the prince and heir that he's been waiting for, which, you know, by, by some horrible twist of fate, I mean, it could have been Thomas Boleyn's son, but it wasn't to be. So it's incredibly cruel of Henry VIII to have Thomas Boleyn there. But, I mean, you know, certainly we do see the Boleyns at court slowly, but they're not there to win back favor or position. They're there because because that's their life and they st- their lives still revolve around the King of England and it's sort of unavoidable. So we do see them in the sources, but they're, they're few and far between. And as I said, Thomas Boleyn is there when he has to be, but otherwise he's a very busy man still down in Kent where he is always, he's always a commissioner of the peace. He's dealing with tenants and landowners and involved in disputes. He's so well respected down there, even after the deaths of his children. So that's really kind of where his mind is, but he's at court when he has to be. Well, that's a positive spin, I guess, on what (laughs) happened after that. And another post-beheading question comes from another listener, Sherry O'Neill. She's wondering what Thomas's relationship was like then with Mary and her children after the deaths of George and Anne. Thomas uh, Thomas was very close to to George and Anne, but with Mary, I don't know. These were two people who just could never quite see eye to eye. I think they were just very different personalities. Now, as I said before, I mean, she makes a pretty good match with William Carey, but then she goes on to be the King of England's mistress, which, as I said, was not something that Thomas wanted for her at all. When William Carey dies, then you start to see the, the cracks emerge in the relationship there because he doesn't necessarily want to help Mary. I think he, I think he's so angry at her for having in, embarked on this affair. And I think he cared very deeply for his son-in-law. And I think it's just sort of, a uh, this potential future and all that might have been is just kind of fallen, you know, around, around their feet. So it's definitely a, a sign that their relationship isn't very good. However, through uh, Anne's queenship, I mean, Mary does do very silly things. She goes on to marry, uh, yes, I mean, a, more or less a soldier from Calais, William Stafford. Uh, and this isn't a good match. And people judge Thomas Boleyn for being angry at Mary and, and sending her away from from court. And of course, Anne sending Mary away from court. But we have to remember that it takes all of their energy constantly to validate that marriage, to keep the world believing in Anne Boleyn's legitimacy as queen. And they are surrounded by people who are just waiting for any opportunity to tear them down and any evidence that they are an unworthy family. So Mary Boleyn going off and marrying, you know, Joe Blow from Calais, it's not what you do when you are the sister of the Queen of England. And it really does cast the, the family in a, in, a, in a harsh light. And I think that's Thomas Boleyn's frustration with his daughter. He just can't understand her life choices, which I think a lot of fathers out there probably feel sometimes with their daughters. No, my father does at some points. Um, but anyway, so this relationship, they did struggle. However, after Anne and George died and towards the end of Thomas's life, we do see some tendrils of conciliation between the two. And I think it comes on Thomas's part, no matter how angry he is at his daughter, he doesn't want her to be destitute. When he dies, he wants to ensure that she does receive some of the family portfolio and the property portfolio. And I actually found in an archive a draft indenture written between uh, Cromwell and Henry VIII and Thomas Boleyn and his brother, who was acting as his lawyer, And it was to ensure that Mary and her husband would 
receive property and then it wouldn't all go to the crown. So it seems like a small gesture after so many years of this this very acrimonious relationship, but it shows that at the end, when Thomas Polini is contemplating his mortality and he feels, I suppose, the end is near, you know, in the end, she was his daughter and he loved her no matter what. So similarly, although not Mary's children, but Anne was also his daughter as well, which obviously once she was executed, it would have hurt him similarly to what happened with Mary. But would would he have gone on to have any sort of relationship with the Princess Elizabeth after that? This question comes from Donna Bill. It's difficult because, of course, Elizabeth is de- declared illegitimate. Uh, so she's no longer the Princess Ma- uh, Elizabeth. She is the Lady Elizabeth. Uh, not that we know of. We we know that they would have seen each other. Well, he would have seen her. Obviously, she's just a little child. Um, he would have seen her at various court functions, like, for example, the christening of of Prince Edward. Uh, but, that you know, these relationships, it's not the same in the Tudor period. He can't just go visit his granddaughter. Uh, she can't just go and visit her grandparents. It doesn't work that way. You know, she's in the she's in the nursery and she's in, in the various estates. And I don't think there was any interaction, not because he didn't want to see his granddaughter, because that's it's just simply not protocol. So whether they did or not, we, we never will really know. I would like to think that he would have wanted to see his granddaughter. I'm sure he would have. I mean, you know, in the end, it's still family and she's the next generation. And she's very much, Elizabeth is very much like her grandfather. I always see a lot of Thomas Boleyn in Elizabeth because I see so much of Anne in Elizabeth and I see so much of Thomas and Anne. So she's definitely, um, she doesn't fall too far from the tree with Elizabeth and her grandfather. Uh, But no, there's no actual evidence that they, that they interacted, unfortunately. Well, that is unfortunate. Um, Okay, perfect. So moving on now to our first George question. Listener Andrea Lawless was wondering, was George Boleyn as pompous and egotistical as he's been portrayed on television? The short answer is no. The long answer is that it suits a particular narrative and it, it suits the framework within fictional portrayals that he is pompous and arrogant because Thomas Boleyn is always seen as the that, uh, pompous and arrogant and therefore, of course, his son is going to be a chip off the old block. You know, they're, they're really always portrayed as this haughty family. It works because the Boleyns work so well as villains in the story of Anne Boleyn in fictional portrayals because Lord knows you can't have Henry VIII as a villain or Cromwell just as a villain anymore. Um, But the Boleyns gratify in that position. We do know that George Boleyn was a young man with very good family connections and very good prospects, of course. We do know that he perhaps was a little cocky at times, and we can see that in some of his correspondence. But he's just a typical young man of the age, and he has everything to play for. He's handsome, he's educated, he's well-respected, he comes from good family stock, he's doing well. But in fact, what we see in George is um, an earnestness and also a frustration. He's very human in the sources. This is a young man who whose career came at the worst possible time when all of the, all of Europe's eyes are on his family, judging them. And so that every everything he did well or every accolade or every praise he received was seen almost as a gift of his sister or because of his sister. So I think, in fact, you know, rather, for, rather than being pompous, and, and arrogant and haughty. This is a very uh, determined young man. He's determined to make a name for himself. And that's really uh, my lasting image of, Tom, of George Boleyn from the sources. So speaking of his sister, was George as close to Mary as he was to Anne? It's difficult to say because we don't have any extant evidence of communication between the two. I, I, I see it as George and Anne being very close, real peas in a pod, whereas, whereas Mary's always been a bit of a lone wolf. I think, like Thomas Boleyn, I think they struggled with Mary. I think they were just very different people. I don't think that, that George was particularly close, not that they had any problem in their relationship, but I don't think he was as close or that they shared the same interests. Um, so no, as far as I can tell, I mean, I know in fictional portrayals, like the other Boleyn girl, she, ha- uh, Gregory has Mary Boleyn very close to George, but unfortunately it's just not backed up by evidence. 
And just real quick, thank you, Sherry O'Neill, for giving us that question. I forgot to mention your name. But okay, so then we'll just take a look at his relationship with Anne a little closer. I know that this one makes some people uncomfortable, but Hannah Larson actually wanted to know if there's any evidence to support that George Boleyn did have an inappropriate relationship with Anne. Uh, no, emphatically no. And this was never, ever something that they were accused of in their lifetime, apart from the obvious accusation, which was, I think, which says a lot more about Thomas Cromwell's imagination than anything else. But no, these were two, they, they, they were brother and sister. It didn't matter if they had spent many years away from each other or, or whatever the argument has been that they were somehow deeply attracted to. No, none of this ever happened. They had a wonderfully close relationship. They adored each other uh, and they shared the same interests and they were very much alike in, in temperament and in their, in their aesthetics, in their, in their uh, taste in art and literature and music. And that's what really, um, I think, probably linked them more than anything else. Uh, they were exceptionally close, but that's really it. We have to remember that, yes, that the the accusation of incest arises because it's just such an unspeakable crime. It's so unbelievable that it's almost believable. And I think that's why Cromwell does it, because it just blackens the name beyond any hope of rehabilitation. And it's it, it, does, it does the job, obviously. I mean, because it, it's this accusation has lingered for so many centuries. And yes, it's something that every now and then is brought up in fiction and whatnot, simply because it is so outrageous and it is such a... Um, an extraordinary charge. And I suppose for Philippa Gregory, it worked as a literary device to have a little bit of incest. She's, she likes that in her novels and that's fine. Uh, but no, it's not backed up by sources or evidence at all. Uh, so it's really unfortunate that, that this, this sort of lingers over their reputations because it's, it just, it came out of nowhere and there's absolutely no evidence for it. I'm so glad to hear that no so emphatically because no one <laughs> wants to believe that. Exactly. <laughs> My goodness. Okay. So moving on then, uh, Samantha Dillon had a question regarding his love life that has nothing to do with his sister. So we can leave that alone now. Was George ever actually in love? It seems to be portrayed that he was forced to marry his wife, Jane. So we were wondering if he had actual feelings for her, if he ever had any anything prior to her. I appreciate the significant interest in George Boleyn's love life. I do. I, I'm, I'm glad that people are out there worried for him and whether he was happy. We We're have to, for him. <laughs> we have to remember that, the, okay, so forced marriages aren't a thing in the Tudor period. We have dynastic marriages and political marriages, but there's no evidence that George Boleyn was forced or would have even felt forced to marry Jane Parker. And it, we have to think about it without, you know, because we tend to read the story backwards. We know how it ends. And so we're looking for little bits of evidence in the beginning of, well, that, you know, that's how this all happened. Uh, George and Jane were a young couple. They were married. They both came from great families and it was a fantastic dynastic match for both of them. There's no reason to believe that they didn't get along or they didn't like each other or that Jane instantly hated him or that he did anything in their marriage, which has also been an interesting feature in fiction as well, that he treated her or mistreated her or abused her uh, physically, sexually, or otherwise. There's no evidence for any of that. We don't know exactly how happy their relationship was as it progressed. I think there were tensions. I think it would be very hard for Jane Boleyn to compete with a sister-in-law who just has all the attention. I don't mean in the terms of a relationship between George and Anne, but Anne, you know, she had a lot of attention around her all the time. There was always some drama going on in her life right up to being queen and even during her queenship. And I think for a wife, it would be very difficult to have it to compete compete with the family drama all the time. So I, I think there was tension. We do know that Jane Boleyn was a great fan of Catherine of Aragon and of the Princess Mary. And we do see some falling out between husband and wife over that particular issue. 
But at the end, we have to remember that Jane Boleyn did not testify against George Boleyn, and that's a very important to to remember because that has made its way into nonfiction and fiction and back again. And it's a really unfortunate accusation that she was participating in the trial. We know that she wasn't. We know that the women who spoke out against uh, George and Anne were all maids and we because they're listed as maids, and J- Jane Boleyn was no maid by that point. We also know that Jane tried to visit her husband in the tower and that she tried to send him clothes and he actually wrote a letter thanking her for that. So there is there is some semblance of a relationship there. Uh, we don't know how happy, as I said, they were towards the end. I mean, I think it, it was a very, very difficult time and a very um, difficult relationship as time progressed. Uh, but certainly, I mean, you know, he wasn't forced to marry her. And in the end, if, if, if Anne had never become queen, who knows how successful that marriage was. And the absence of children doesn't mean it was unsuccessful either. So we have to stop judging them for not having children. We're just going to continue riding this train of what George's <laughs> love life looked like <laughs> and how fictional portrayals continue to shape our view of him. Yes. So Al Pratt uh, would like to know, because it's been widely speculated that George was gay, hmm. is there any evidence that you know of to support this theory as well? No, 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 no. I could just say no all day. We, this comes from some really imaginative interpretations of George Boleyn's love life. And some of it has come from this book that he wrote in, which was like a, a satire on, on marriage and the fact that he wrote in it and then oh, Mark Smeaton also wrote in it seems to be some kind of evidence they had a, a, a relationship, except that Thomas Wyatt also wrote in the book and no one ever says, oh, my gosh, Wyatt and George Boleyn. No, they, they you know, so it, it fits a particular narrative, but only if you you really narrow the focus and you if you block out all of the other evidence. Uh, it did become popular obviously because of Cavendish's poem where he writes about Thomas Boleyn, sorry, George Boleyn, I should say, um, kind of being a beast and deflowering and forcing maidens, except that Cavendish is putting words into George's mouth and he puts words into the mouths of various men who are executed. We have Thomas Culpepper talking about, you know, bestiality and how maybe that's not a good idea. Uh, so it's it doesn't say anything about George Boleyn, these accusations or these insinuations, I should say. It really, there's no evidence at all. How it's become very popular in fictional portrayals is, like, for example, in the Showtime series, The Tudors. I mean, I spoke to actors who were in that show. I spoke to Natalie Dormer and Nick Dunning, who played Thomas Boleyn. And it it was designed to tick a box, and it ticked a particular box, and that's why it was there. It was a degree of representation, but I just thought, well, that's that's terrible representation for George Boleyn because it, it being gay is one thing, but you've made him abusive and just generally an awful person. And so that was very unfortunate. But no, I mean, there's no evidence that he was gay. There was no evidence that he was necessarily a womanizer. It just plays into this idea of a licentious family, um, a, a, you know, low born and and common and depraved. It just feeds into that narrative. And that's why it was so necessary. Well, thank you. I hope we've cleared up all the questions about George <laughs> Bullen's romantic history. Yes. <laughs> so going forward, we have one last question from, Sa- I struggled with her last name because it looks like it's Pilates, but it might be <laughs> highlights. I'm not sure. Sarah, I'm so sorry. Um, so again, our last question is kind of out of left field, but interesting nonetheless. Did George have an illegitimate child who fled to Ireland? It sounds like a great story, but no. I know that there is this uh, tomb uh, in Ireland and it does say that this person, George Boleyn, is the son of George Boleyn or whatever. Yeah, I forgot exactly what the detail is, but no. Um, There's no evidence that why would the son of George Boleyn flee England in any case? I mean, all the other uh, children managed to stick around. There was no need to flee. Um, so it's an odd, it's an odd story. I think that there, there are, um, there's more than one George Berlin. We, we do know that it wasn't necessarily the most uncommon of names, oddly enough. Uh, so, and I know that we, ju- we want to somehow believe that he'd lived on somewhere and it's a lovely romantic notion, but there's no evidence that the two Berlins, uh, this George Boleyn and 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 George Boleyn George Boleyn uh, were uh, you know anything maybe they were distant cousins but that's about as close as it gets. There's just no evidence that he had a son at all. It definitely would have been remarked on. I mean, Chapuis would have gotten right in there and said, "I heard this." 
So it's, it's unfathomable that no one, one would have known. And it's also unfathomable that Thomas Berlin, if he'd had a grandson, wouldn't have um, made note of it or, or stepped in and tried to rear the boy himself. I mean, why, why would they reject this boy if this boy actually existed? So it absolutely makes no sense. Thank you so much for helping us out today. Um, it was so much fun chatting with you. Thank you again for answering all the questions from our listeners. I can't wait to have you back again for everybody that's listening. Dr. Mackay is the author of Inside the Tudor Court, the biography of Eustace Chapuis, and Among the Wolves of Court, the untold story of Thomas and George Boleyn. Where can our listeners find you? I'm everywhere. Uh, I have oh, a website. <laughs> Just I look am. everywhere. <laughs> look everywhere. I'm, I'm on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is uh, Regina Saba which is obviously a little play on the Queen of Sheba. And uh, my website is uh, www.laurenmackay.co.uk. You can find me there. Otherwise, just I, just Google me. I, I really am everywhere. I, I try to keep a nice open profile. <laughs> I can attest to that. I did Google you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, Lauren. Thanks Thank for you. Joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And now, a brief history. The Tudors were not a family destined to be lucky in love. Henry VIII, of course, would be famed for his six marriages, but there were many others in the family who suffered anguish and heartache because of their bloodline and claims to the throne. Margaret Douglas was the niece of Henry VIII. She was the daughter of Henry's older sister, who had been the Queen of Scotland. After the Queen was widowed, she had married again to the Earl of Angus. It was not a happy union. Political turmoil made the pregnant queen flee her country for a time, and Margaret was born in England in 1515. Margaret spent most of her youth at English court. Though she wasn't raised by her mother, she would later display the same bold spirit. The queen discovered Angus had been spending her fortune on his mistresses and sought an annulment of their marriage. King Henry, who was seeking an annulment of his own so he could marry Anne Boleyn, was utterly scandalized by his sister's defiance of the sanctity of marriage and wrote her a long, chastising letter about it and was utterly aghast when the Pope's shameless sentence gave Margaret her freedom in 1527. Henry seems to have been fond of Margaret Douglas. She was a pretty, pleasant young girl who seems to have been popular with the other nobles. Though Margaret was the daughter of a queen, she wasn't a princess. But she appears to have been treated as one at English court. Henry spent lavishly on clothing for her and her servants, and would periodically send her cash so that she could gamble. After he set aside Catherine of Aragon and bastardized his daughter Mary, Margaret was heir apparent, though Henry expected that very soon his new wife, Anne Boleyn, would give him a son. Well, Anne only produced a daughter. Henry executed her only three years later, and Princess Elizabeth was also deemed a bastard. When Jane Seymour rode through the city for the first time as Henry's third queen, Margaret Douglas rode directly behind her, richly bejeweled, her red hair proclaiming her Tudor bloodline and her position, her proximity to the throne itself. But as she rode behind Jane, Margaret must have been trying hard to conceal her anxiety because the wheels of fortune had once again turned at court. Those who had been high in the king's favor during Anne's reign were now in the bottom, and that included the man Margaret secretly loved. Thomas Howard was born in 1511, the eighth child of the Duke of Norfolk, whose sister had been Anne Boleyn's mother. Though he was almost a decade younger than she was, Thomas was Anne Boleyn's uncle. Both Thomas and Margaret were active in the court's literary circles, and a manuscript of court poetry, known as the Devonshire Manuscript, contains several poems by Thomas during their relationship, describing a courtly flirtation that steadily grew in intensity. Each played their prescribed roles, with Margaret playing hard to get, and Thomas as the adoring swain trying to overcome his lady's disdain. Thomas later said that he and Margaret had been in love for a 12-month. Though there isn't any record of it, Anne Boleyn may have encouraged the relationship between the king's niece and her uncle. She had recently promoted the match of Mary Howard to the king's bastard son, Henry Fitzroy. 
The marriage between Thomas and Margaret would strengthen Anne's family ties to the throne. Without Anne's support, however, the match was an unlikely one. As a son so low in the line of inheritance and undistinguished at court, Thomas didn't have the rank or the wealth to be a worthy match of the niece of the king and a daughter of a queen. The king would likely have his own ideas of where to place such a valuable matrimonial pawn. It's probably why the two kept their relationship so quiet, hoping for the right moment to approach the king. In the early months of 1536, Margaret and Thomas went through a betrothal ceremony with a few friends as witnesses. It was a bold move. In the Tudor era, a ceremony such as this was just as binding as marriage and required a church dispensation to dissolve it. Perhaps they were hoping that the king would accept a fate accompli, as they had with his sister Mary, who had impetuously married Charles Brandon. But in April, Queen Anne was arrested for adultery and treason. She went to the scaffold on the 19th of May, and King Henry married Jane Seymour on the 30th. Princess Elizabeth was declared a bastard, and now Margaret was again the heir apparent, and that made her newly formed betrothal a matter of state interest. It must have been a dizzying, terrifying, and confusing time for Margaret, who had to already know that things did not bode well for her future. Around the 15th of July, King Henry became aware of his niece's betrothal, and was much incensed at conceiving that one, so joined in blood, to him and his nephew, the Scottish king, should not be given, nor taken, without his consent, especially when she lived so near him. Margaret and Thomas were arrested and sent to the tower on the 8th of July. Thomas was accused of Without the knowledge or assent of our said most dread sovereign the king, contemptuously and traitorously, contracted himself by crafty, fair and flattering words. To and with the Lady Margaret Douglas being natural daughter to the Queen of Scots, the said Lord Thomas, by reason of marriage, in so high a blood, and to one, such which pretendeth to be lawful daughter, to the Queen of Scots, should aspire by her to the dignity of the imperial crown of this realm. There's an important thing to note here. By calling Margaret the natural daughter and the pretended lawful daughter of the Queen of Scots, Henry had just called Margaret's legitimacy into question and her claim to the throne as well. This was because of Margaret's mother's annulment of her marriage to Angus, the annulment that had caused Henry to clutch his pearls in outrage, even while he was trying to end his own marriage to Catherine of Aragon. On the 18th of July, Henry passed a statute that made it treason for anyone to approach any woman who was an heir to the throne with an offer of marriage without royal assent, and that any royal woman who consented to such a match would suffer the same pains and penalties. In other words, Henry was now using the annulment of her mother's marriage as a tool to disinherit Margaret, and at the same time he punished her as an heir who dared to contract a marriage without his consent. The lovers were now, retroactively, guilty of treason. Margaret had to be terrified. Now, some authors have claimed that she was housed near the lieutenant's lodgings, where she could look out on the tower green where the scaffold had stood at the patch of grass that had once been soaked with Anne Boleyn's blood. It would remind her, loudly and clearly, that no prior affection or royal status would spare a person from the blade. Though the prisoners were housed separately, it appears that they managed to communicate. The Devonshire manuscript contains poems transcribed in Margaret's hand that seem to be romantic odes the lovers sent to one another during their captivity. This one from Margaret is likely the first of what is known as the Tower Poems. Now may I mourn as one of late, driven by force from my delight, and cannot see my lonely mate, to whom forever my heart is plight. Alas, that ever prison strong, should such two lovers separate. Yet though our bodies suffer throng, our hearts should be of one estate. And Thomas wrote in response, The one of us from the other they do absent which unto us is a deadly wound, seeing we love in this intent, in God's laws for to be bound. Back and forth they wrote, sometimes optimistic, sometimes bitter, protesting and lamenting the fate that kept them apart. They vowed their hearts would always remain true, even if they were forced away from one another. Margaret wrote to Thomas, I may well say with joyful heart, 
as never woman might say before. That I have taken to my part. The faithfulest lover that was ever born. Great pains he suffers for my sake. Continually night and day. For all the pains that he does take. From me his love will not decay. In one of his final poems, Thomas seems to have realized that their love story would not have a happy ending. He imagined himself dying on a distant shore from his love, like a mythological hero. And long may your life and joy endure. But when you come by my sepulchre, remember that your fellow resteth there. For I love Deke, though I unworthy were. Margaret's mother in Scotland heard of her daughter's imprisonment and wrote to her brother begging that Margaret be released and sent back to her where she would never trouble Henry again. But Henry was not about to lose custody and surveillance over a potential heir to the throne. Though he sent no written reply, his messengers probably assured the queen that Jane Seymour was pregnant and if her child was a son, that Margaret would be released from the tower. It's highly unlikely that Henry ever considered executing Margaret. Most people expected that he had only sentenced her to death so he could appear magnanimous in pardoning her. On the 23rd of July, Eustace Chapuy reported to the emperor that Margaret had been pardoned her life because she had never slept with Thomas. If she had, the betrothal would have been considered a full marriage and she would have had little value on the marriage market as someone who wasn't a virgin and was dubiously single. As summer progressed to fall, both Margaret and Thomas fell ill from what may have been either typhoid or malaria. The king's personal physicians were sent to treat both prisoners. On the 12th of October, after a long and agonizing labor, Jane Seymour gave birth to a son. The danger Margaret posed was suddenly reduced. She was still ailing, and so the king decided to have her move to Sion Abbey, which would one day host the doomed Catherine Howard. At the time, Sion was still a convent and one of the wealthiest in the country. In these luxurious surroundings, Margaret could recuperate from her illness and enjoy the abbey's extensive library, as well as stroll in the gardens and orchards. It may have been here, once her personal property was returned to her, that Margaret transcribed the Tower poems into the Devonshire manuscript. Though she was still technically the king's prisoner, she was allowed freedom on the grounds to have her own personal servants with her, and to have visitors. Margaret had once vowed in her poems that her love would withstand all suffering inflicted on her, but perhaps the reality of that suffering had finally broken her down. Maybe she was weakened by her illness, or maybe she had simply realized that there was no way that they could define the will of the king. In any case, she wrote to Cromwell that she was grateful to be taken back into the king's favor, and would rather die than offend him again. But seeing, my lord, that it is your pleasure, that I shall keep none, that did belong to my lord Thomas, I will put them from me. And I beseech you, not to think that any fancy, doth remain in me touching him, but that all my study, and care, is how to please the king's grace, and to continue in his favor. Her heart still bore the scars. She added a poem around this time to the Devonshire manuscript that ends with two sorrowful lines. But mourn, I may, those weary days, that, are appointed, to be mine. On the 31st of October, Thomas Howard died. It would later be claimed that he was poisoned, But that seems unlikely since the king spent a rather large sum on medical treatments for him. He just simply never recovered from whatever illness that had also afflicted Margaret. Margaret took his death very hard, and only four days after being told of his death, she was appointed as mourner in Queen Jane's funeral procession. It's not hard to imagine that as she performed the rites for Jane, that she was also mourning Thomas. Years later, she wrote, When, of my lord, I considered the case, and how, for my love, his life was undone. I wept the young white, that for my love, his life did in bonds pay, and yielded his corpse to another in clay. Margaret's later life was just as interesting as her youth. She would marry when she was 29 to a Scottish earl, and her son would become the second husband of Mary Queen of Scots. It was an era in which most couples' unions had been arranged, and ideally they hoped for cordial and respectful relations with their spouse, and so Margaret was very fortunate. Her marriage was a happy one, and the couple came to love one another deeply. 
Her husband addressed her in letters as his, quote, sweet Madge, but she never forgot her youthful passion for Thomas. In 1561, she was imprisoned in the tower once more and reportedly said, Thrice have I been cast into prison, not for matters of treason, but for matters of love. First, when Thomas Howard, son to Thomas, first Duke of Norfolk, was in love with myself. Then, for the love of Henry Darnley, my son, to Queen Mary of Scotland. And lastly, for the love of Charles, my younger son, to Elizabeth Cavendish. Though Henry's will had disinherited her, likely based on her mother's annulment, Margaret Douglas's bloodline would inherit the throne of England after the last Tudor monarch died. And that concludes this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please show your support by leaving a review wherever you listen. Reviews are some of the greatest gifts that you can leave a podcaster because it suggests their show to people who may not have even known it existed. So thank you so much for your support. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening.